thank you for coming. It's nice to be here. Um, it's early in the morning. So. And thank you to the session organizers for, for making this possible. Um, unmanned aerial systems are, are capable of creating stunning imagery. Uh, we all have seen drones you know, proliferating the skies. Um, those pictures are often uh, used kind of as pretty pictures we put on our desktops and maybe in a presentation. But as, as, as this audience likely knows, there's so much more power in those pictures and data that can be uh, harnessed. Um, and so it's moving beyond you know, these nice pretty pictures that I'd like to talk about today. Um, in this paper, I'm going to describe how we're using aerial photogrammet photogrammetry to map uh, large-scale sites, uh, identify obscured archaeological features, as well as visualize terrain over uh, three different case studies that I'll talk about here today. Um, the first being the uh, Dare Plateau in the Nabatine Kingdom of Petra. Uh, the second is a site in northern Mex Mexico known as Paquime. Uh, just south of the uh, U U.S. border. And then the third, um, a, a non-UNESCO World Heritage Site, I thought I'd throw in a, something a little different, uh, the site of, uh, the Aztatlan site of Santo Domingo, which is uh, on the coastal plain of Jalisco, Jalisco Mexico. Um, it's near uh, the town of Puerto Vallarta. Somebody had to do it, so we figured, well, why not us? Um, Results from these case studies are presented in this paper include creating new and accurate topographic maps, identifying architect architectural features and alignments, as well as pinpointing unexcavated regions of interest uh, for future research. I will conclude that harnessing the data within these uh, photogra photogrammetric images offer access to a wealth of knowledge and information and that can be utilized in, in many different ways. So there are many who have contributed to the concept of photogrammetry and this definition seems to be moving and changing quite a bit. I've heard many different versions just in this conference and how photogrammetry is defined. Um, you can kind of see the version that I'm using, although original ideas were just being able to take measurements off of photographs. Um, where in contrast, structure from motion again is kind of melding with this concept of photogrammetry and the two words are often used interchangeably. Uh, but in this case, a structure from motion gives you the ability to create these 3D structures uh, and resolve some kind of uh, element from overlapping and offset images. This often doesn't require targets uh, depending on the, the quality of the model that you need. Okay, so I'm going to go into my case studies. We're going to start in Petra. Um, in 2013, faculty, staff, and students uh, decided to work on a survey of Petra, uh, specifically the Adair Plateau, which is a high plateau above the city center. Um, very little work had been done there as far as survey goes, because I think the, the monument on top kind of draws everyone's attention, but the surrounding area uh, needed some work done. Um, the site is located about 200 kilometers south of Amman. Um, it's a very remote area, uh, very rugged, um, and it dates to about the first century AD. Most of, of Petra does. Like I said, there's very little documentation about Petra, or, sorry, not Petra, the Adair Plateau. This is the only map I know of. This is a tourist map, and you can see up in the corner, that's Adair. There's no real topographic information of that of that site itself. It's a pretty significant area in Petra. One of the challenges we faced was, as I mentioned, the terrain. Um, traditionally, surveying this plateau would have been uh, dangerous at best in some cases. Um, and having students out there, especially undergrads, would have been a scary proposition. So we decided that a UAV would be a good way to cover and, and map this uh, plateau itself. Uh, the other thought was, well, why, why, you know, we could hire a plane or a pilot, but uh, getting a plane in Amman would be quite expensive and, and a risky proposition as well. Uh, the UAV that we used, uh, well, it's actually UAS, is the X100. This is uh, a gate wing system that was bought by Trimble. Uh, there's some information that shows you its capabilities here on the screen. Um, 
It also has a underbelly camera, 10 megapixel capability. Um, it's a, a belly lander, so it makes things interesting when you're, when you're landing and, and protecting that camera. The, the system has some things in place to keep that lens protected. The camera is capable of 10 megapixels, as I mentioned, which is not great, but it actually gives you a ground sampling distance of between 3.3 to 25 centimeters, depending on your altitude. During the project, we also put on uh, ground control points in order to, to georectify the imagery and, and tighten the precision. Uh, we used six, we probably should have used nine just to get a little more coverage. Uh, we recorded the positions of each GCP using a Trimble GOXH uh, with a tornado antenna to try and really increase the uh, quality. The flight over Adair took about 30 minutes to cover a square kilometer. That's the great thing about a fixed wing system is it can cover quite a bit of terrain. Uh, we launched and landed about two kilometers from, from the Adair Plateau. There's not a lot of open flat land, so we had to find some farming area that was furrowed, which made landing quite interesting. Uh, we also had a challenge with camels coming across our landing site, which made things really interesting. Uh, but we were able to get the owner to move them before we came in and landed. So just keep that in mind if you ever fly in Adair. Uh, we flew at 300 meters in altitude and captured 285 images. Uh, we basically flew a north-south trans or flew north-south transects, 16 of them in total, with a GSD of 11 centimeters per pixel. That's pretty decent for a, a 10 megapixel camera. Uh, we were able to create an ortho mosaic using Pix4D Mapper. This is a company out of Switzerland, uh, Pix4D. This just shows you kind of a snippet of that ortho mosaic. Um, just for scale, you can see those little white dots, those are outhouses. Gives you an idea of just how large the monument is. And I'll zoom in here. Um, so that, that area is the zoom in, and we'll come in and take a look. This is the close-up of the monument itself, uh, one of our ground control points. And you can kind of see um, there's quite a bit going on in the plateau as far as archaeological features go. In order to help us survey this terrain, uh, we used ArcGIS to generate a survey grid. Uh, this way, we could upload this grid onto a GPS and help us keep track of where we were, what sections we had covered, how much of it we covered, and which features were in the, which grid. Basically, just to organize what we were doing. We collected the features using a Trimble GeoXH as well, uh, just mapping in archaeological uh, structures, uh, water channels, which are quite prevalent up there. Uh, and other features. This is the result. It's a combination of, of all of the data. The topographic map was generated from the DEM captured uh, by the aerial imagery. Um, all of the red or all of the different archaeological features collected during the survey. It's quite extensive. This is just the sec section of it. It's um, quite far to the north and south. To the west, you would follow the cliff so we don't go too far over there. Uh, and to the east, we actually were able to identify some features up on top of the cliffs that really had been unknown before we were before the flight. Part of this uh, project also included some public outreach, and a documentary was created on the, uh, the project itself. And animations from the aerial imagery <coughs> are used in, in this uh, documentary. So this just shows if it'll run. Yes. So this is an animation from the, uh, the photogrammetric imagery. This is not a video, this is an actual model you're looking at in animation. So some, those are some of the things we were able to do with our flight over uh, Petra. I'm going to move to a different continent. We're going to head to Mexico and the city of Pacime. Pacime is uh, an adobe city, quite large for the, the southwestern region. It was built around a central polity with ceremonial mounds, multiple structures, and Mesoamerican style ball courts. Uh, the city was, was quite big for its time um, and reached its zenith about AD 1300. Very little had been done um, as far as mapping this site. There were some aerial images from earlier work done by Charles de Peso. But we felt like updating that would be very helpful as well as generating a top topographic map. As you can see, that, as I mentioned, it's located uh, just south of the U.S. border. Um, this is a great depiction, uh, drawing by DePesso, showing what Pacame may have looked like uh, 
ceremonial mounds, uh, multi-room structures. Similar to Adair, we used the X-100. Uh, Dr. Searcy and I flew in 2015 uh, over the site. Uh, in this case, we did use nine ground control points to really tighten up what we were doing. This just shows you the, the flight plan, uh, the takeoff and landing. We were just about 700 meters outside of the, the, the World Heritage boundary itself. Um, we flew a little bit over the city, but tried to stay away from the population as much as we could. Uh, during the flight, we captured 422 photographs, um, covered about a uh, half square kilometer. Um, and Took about 32 minutes for the flight, uh, about 150 meters above the ground. Again, that's the great thing about fixed wings is the amount of time you can stay in the air. Uh, it resulted in a ground sampling distance of 5.6 centimeters per pixel at our 150 meter altitude. Um, this is using PIX4D, showing each of the locations of the camera as it took the picture. Uh, the quality check returned a median of 24,700-ish key points per image, uh, which gave us a difference between initial camera parameters and optimized parameters of about 0.07%. Um, we had some good matches and, and great coverage, and an, an error of about 0.09 meters uh, with the ground control points. So about 9 centimeters, a little bit of error there. So this is a single photo of Pakime from the UAS, pretty good resolution. Uh, and then the ortho mosaic, combining those 422 images into the, the, the full ortho mosaic. One of the unique, unique things we did with Pakime was look at the reservoirs. Water, as you can imagine in the desert, is, is pretty important. And to maintain a large population, uh, some kind of water control is required. And we wanted to understand how much volume could these reservoirs hold and what could that tell us about the population at Pakimei? There are some ideas about what they thought based on the architecture, but volumetric information about the reservoirs can give us a better idea. This is something that's ongoing and we'll be looking into the sustainability uh, issues, but we're, this one reservoir itself could hold about 828 cubic um, liters so was, yeah, of water. Um, and so, yeah, this, this is something that we're going to look into further and see if we can get a better idea of, of what this can do for the city. So from the imagery, we were able to take older maps that, that the PESO had drawn and combined it with a, a new topographic map, contour lines generated from the area imagery. And then we included the, the archaeological work by the PESO and, and the designations of the rooms uh, to get this combined map to really pull everything together at Pakimei. We were also able to create a digital surface model uh, that we exported into ArcMap to do some slope analysis and hillshade modeling. Um, this just gives you a better idea of the relief and mainly we wanted to look at where and really get a better idea of where the unexcavation, unexcavated portions of Pakimei are located. You can kind of see in the hillshade, this is good, these areas here that are showing up quite nicely, uh, these unexcavated portions of the city. Um, they're not as easy to see on the ground or in the, uh, the RGB imagery. But when you look at it in the, in the slope analysis, it really starts to show up as well. Uh, so those sections, as I pointed out, and then the sections to the south. This is gonna help us understand um, where we where to move further in excavations at Pakimei. So the SFM model was also used to generate an animation. This is also used for kind of public outreach. It's it's playing in a museum to kind of show Pakimei from the air and animating through to just get a feel for the site itself. Okay, so we're going to leave Pakimei and we're going to head south down to the Pacific Coast. Um, we're going to look at an Aztatlan site, um, which dated to, the date at this site we don't really know for sure, so it's somewhere between 900 to 1450 AD. Um, it's right along the Pacific near Puerto Vallarta, if you've ever been there. So this gives you an, just kind of an idea of its location right on the coast. Um, it's currently under, under threat. There's been some construction 
uh, for housing that have cut through some of the mounds at the site. So we were asked while we were there doing some other work to fly Santo Domingo uh, so that they could get a baseline for the site and um, get an understanding of how much damage is really occurring there. We flew this time with a DJI Phantom 4 Pro, uh, again using ground, uh, sorry, excuse me, using uh, Ground Station Pro, which is an automated flight path system. Worked really well for us. Um, we could predefine where we needed to fly, we could upload, and, and then we were ready to go. Uh, we flew at about 100 meters. There were some large power lines in the way, which made us a little nervous. Um, so I wanted to make sure we were cleared over those. Um, and we covered about a quarter of a kilometer square and it took about 15 minutes to fly the site. Um, and in this case, we recorded 156 georectified images. The result was a, um, just a nice you know, uh, orthomosaic uh, using Photoscan Pro, which is a great program. I love Pix4D, but Photoscan has some capabilities that I really like as well. Um, the 156 photos resulted in about 138,000 unique tie points for this site um, with a ground sampling distance of about 3.39 centimeters per pixel, which is not bad at 100 meters. Uh, this dense point cloud we used to create a polygonal mesh, you know, all the good stuff, the DSMs, uh, orthomosaic, as well as the tile model, which is another feature that's great in Photoscan. Um, the hillshade, though, really helped us get a better idea of the architecture at Santo Domingo. It really popped out a lot better than with the, um, just the RGB orthomosaic. And we really can pick out these multi-room structures, walls, mounds. Uh, you can see, the, see them standing out here, this area as well. This is where the bulldozer cut through the mound. And you can actually see the bulldozer work uh, showing up in this hill shape. So we really were able to get an idea of where the damage had been done, where uh, the work was happening. Just in comparison, um, here we go. This is a, a map of, of a survey done at the site, kind of a sketch map of some of the architecture. And then if you look at a comparison from our flight using the hill shape, we get a really good look at that structure. And I think some other features popping out more than what was visible from the survey itself. There's some really interesting edges, platform edges showing up nicely, uh, this building as well. So it was a really useful tool to help us visualize and see kind of these features that aren't really easily visible in the RGB imagery. So to conclude, I'm just, just going to say that you know, these UASs are capable of a lot and we're able to capture a lot of data and say a lot about what um, the imagery that we capture. And the cost and time to use and learn these systems is decreasing, making it much more available for, for many people to use. Um, and the miniaturization, I think, is a, a critical thing as well of sensors and the different kinds of sensors that are going to be available and already are being available on these smaller systems. Uh, and it's really going to help us and it's going to happen and it's happening at quite a rapid speed. I just want to thank uh, a few people. I'm thankful to Tübingen and the university here, of course, the session organizers. Uh, a lot of the professors who have supported this work as well as students um, who have been involved as well. So thank you. Thank you.